Josh? Yeah. You can pull the mic off. Oh, great. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks, Josh, for inviting me. Thanks um, for, I feel really distant from you all. And it's, you can tell it's a Catholic crowd because all the front rows of all the sections are empty. So <laughs> that's fine, except for, <laughs> except for you guys. That was awesome. I mean, in good, I meant that in a good way. All right, all right. Well, no, seriously, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really pumped. I'm pumped to be talking about the environment on Earth Day. Um, before we do anything else, I want to actually start with a little game. Okay? Sound good? Anybody up for a game? Yeah. It's not that fun, so don't get that excited. But <laughs> here's what's, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to throw out a quote from a movie or a book or something like that, and you tell me what I'm quoting. Okay? Does that sound fair? They'll start pretty easy. So if I said, uh, may the force be with you. Star Wars, and you would say, in with your spirit. <laughs> Did anybody, was anybody tempted to be like, in with your spirit? Because I was. Okay, Star Wars. Um, I wish the ring had never come to me. Lord the ring, the, the ring kind of gave it away, right? Um, there's no place like home. The Wizard of Oz. Uh, okay, now they're going to get a little bit harder. Um, uh, call me Ishmael. Moby Dick. Yeah, it's the first line of Moby Dick. Very good. Um, this next one is, is kind of hard, but this is one of my favorite quotes from any book ever written. It's a little bit difficult. Beauty will save the world. No? Wait, what did you say? No? <laughs> no, you're in the right genre. No, it's not in, it's Russian. It's not Tolstoy, you're close. It's Dostoevsky from a book called, from a book called The Idiot. It, Brothers Karamazov is the only one that anyone ever thinks of. But there's another book called The Idiot, <laughs> which is a fantastic book. But Fyodor Dostoevsky, who wrote The Brothers Karamazov, his great line said, beauty will save the world. I want to come back to that. So put that back in your memory banks. One last one. It is finished. Jesus. Gospel of John. <laughs> Good. <laughs> There's actually two references I want to mention. So the Bible is the one. I'm glad most of you got that. I've given this talk before, and usually people are like, I don't know. Um, yes, it was quoted in The Passion of the Christ, but originally from the Bible. But it also showed up... It also showed up in one other movie, a, a popular movie that was recent. Anyone know? No, not Son of God. And it's one probably most of you have seen. It has to do with a lion and some kids. Yeah, the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The, um, the one that came out a few years ago, there's been a number of different editions and versions of that, but remember the one that came out, I think it was like 2005 or something like that? The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe had that line. There's an interesting story about that line. That movie, you guys seen that movie? Pretty much you know what I'm talking about. So uh, it was directed by a guy named Andrew Adamson, who's a, a well-known director, and I think he's Australian or something, but I heard an interview that he was doing, I think he was doing it with a, a Christian magazine or something, and he was giving this, it was around 2005, I think, and they were interviewing him, and he was talking about the movie, and how they were doing it, and there was this question that came up, and they said, you know, we thought it was interesting, the interviewers said, we thought it was interesting that at one point in the movie, when Aslan, remember the lion Aslan, when the white witch kills him, and he's dying on that stone altar, there's this moment where Aslan, right before he dies, he says, it is finished. And they said, we thought that was interesting because, you know, the C.S. Lewis book that this is all based on didn't have that. That line wasn't in there. And he said, yeah, I, I thought it was really an interesting line. I really liked it. And the interviewer said, well, you know, that's also what Jesus said on the cross, of course. And he said, you're kidding. I had no idea. <laughs> And they were talking about how, in some senses, you know, the, the book is allegorical and, and Aslan could be seen as like a Christ figure. And he's like, I had no idea. Jesus said that. That's really cool. And he was kind of excited. And I don't know if maybe someone in the script writing department knew that, but he didn't. But it was strange. And he was really taken aback by it. Now, what on earth does that possibly have to do with environmentalism and Catholic environmentalism and that? Well, I actually think it has a lot to do with it. Here's why. I grew up, like, like Josh mentioned, I'm from Boulder that way, up the street. Um, you've probably heard of it. We have a little university up there as well. It's the other one. Um, <laughs> you've heard it. Anyway, but I, I, so I work there now. I live there. But I also grew up in Boulder. 
And I don't know where you guys grew up, and I don't think it's that uncommon, but Boulder's a very environmentally conscious place, and there's a lot of thought and talk and uh, intentionality toward doing things that will protect the environment. And I think that's a very, very good thing, and I can't imagine it's that much different here. But I feel like it's almost highlighted in Boulder, and every other car is a Prius, and Priuses aren't bad either, but um, actually, it's a funny story about the Prius, and this, is, this matters too. The Prius, I heard a study, I read a study about the Toyota Prius, and I don't, maybe some of you drive a Prius, so this isn't a slam on Prius owners, but I read this study about the Toyota Prius, and this came out a few years ago, so maybe it's dated, but among all hybrid cars, the Toyota Prius sold way more than any other hybrid car made all put together. And the researchers were curious why this was happening, and so they, they looked into it, and it turned out that people who bought the Toyota Prius, now not everybody, but by and large, people who bought the Prius bought it for a specific reason. And you know, you can buy lots of other hybrid cars. You could buy a Toyota Camry that's a hybrid or a Honda Civic, but the problem is, if someone sees you driving your Honda Civic down the road, they don't necessarily know if you're driving a hybrid or not, because you could have a non-hybrid version of the Civic. But if you're driving a Prius, everybody knows that you're driving a hybrid car. And so they found out that a lot of people bought the Prius just so that everyone would know how environmentally conscious they were. And again, I don't mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the numbers were so out of this world that I think it was NPR or something. They're like, something's going on here. Now, I think that actually has something to do with what we're talking about today because it kind of demonstrates my point. Now, what does this have to do with Andrew Adamson and the Chronicles of Narnia? Well, what it has to do with it is this. Again, I grew up in Boulder. A lot of us, I'm, I'm sure I assume, were raised with this idea that caring the, for the environment is a very important thing. I grew up knowing that you gotta recycle your cans and your bottles and you have to do this and this is almost a, almost a sin not to. And again, that's not a bad thing. These are good things, but here's the problem. I don't know if a lot of us understand exactly why we're doing that. It's a cool thing, it's a good thing, we know it's an important thing, but I don't know if we're always entirely sure why it's a good thing and a cool thing and an important thing. It's kind of like Andrew Adamson who recognized, wow, that's a really powerful line. I don't really know why it's powerful, but something about it strikes me. But I don't know why that is. And I think for a lot of us, that's sort of the deal with the environment. We know it's important, we know we should care about it, but I'm not entirely sure why. Aside from the obvious, it's beautiful, it's there, we should care for the things that we're given, we're supposed to be stewards. But to tell you the truth, for Christians and for those of us who are Catholic, I think this question is a very important one. Because we who are Catholics and who are Christians actually have a much bigger problem. Because we have this strange little belief that this world as we know it will pass away someday, don't we? The world will end. And it might raise some people to question, well, why would you care for a creation that is just set to be destroyed anyway? What's the difference, right? And that's actually kind of a good question. I want to um, quote something. I was reading a, uh, an academic journal a while ago. It was a journal called Conservation Biology. And the, article, the author of this article is a guy named David Orr. He's an environmental biologist. And he was studying the relationship between um, environmental scientists, environmental biologists, and what he called fundamental or evangelical Christians. And I got the impression he didn't totally understand Christianity as a whole, so he just kind of lumped them all together. But what he said is this, he has a great quote, and I just want to quote him on this. He points to what he called a really interesting convergence of views between conservation biologists, so biologists, scientists who are concerned about the environment, on one hand, and religious fundamentalists on the other hand. Really interesting convergence. He said both of them agree that our world is going to hell in the proverbial handbasket. <laughs> but after that, the differences are great and the implications are very different. And what he realizes, we have all these scientists and all these biologists and conservationists that recognize that there are big time problems in the world and in the environment and things are not headed in the right direction and we have to fix it. And he said simultaneously, I noticed that there were a lot of Christians, a particular kind of Christian maybe, who realized all the same things. The world is getting worse every day. The natural disasters are getting worse. Every, you know, every time I turn on the news, I feel like we're having the worst whatever one of these that we've ever had before, right? Hurricane, typhoon, snowstorm, earthquake, whatever it is, it's always the worst one. And I think that's true. I think something's actually escalating. So he said, yeah, Christians are seeing this too, but their conclusions are very different. And the conclusion, David Orr said, of a lot of Christians is that that's actually a really good thing because it means the end of the world is coming. And that's what we want because when the world ends, 
Jesus will come back. And he says, this is a problem. And he actually, he's pretty fair as an academic. He criticizes both. He says, you know, the environmentalists just want to throw money at the problem, and they're not really actually looking at why humans are behaving this way. The Christians don't even seem to care about the problem, so they don't, they're not concerned about why we're behaving this way. But he recognized that there's this one group of Christians, it's a very big group of Christians, who seem to hold this contradictory view, who recognize that there are things going on in the environment that are problematic, and who recognize that we actually need to do something about that, but who also believe that Christ is coming back and the world will end. Do you see the problem? Creation is weird. There's a lot of problems in nature. We should do something about it, yet Jesus is coming back and it's all going to be destroyed anyway. Do you guys see the problem? Because if you aren't Christians, if you aren't Catholics, if you are faithful, this is a problem that we should all actually have to ask ourselves. Yeah, why does it matter? Because Jesus is coming back. Put that aside for a moment. I want to go back a little ways. We have to take a step back to, to get this. Uh, in 1967, there was a mis medieval historian named Lynn White Jr. Anybody heard of Lynn White Jr. before? I'm surprised. I'm actually genuinely surprised. Lynn White Jr., here's why he's important. He wrote an essay called The Historical Roots of Our e the historical roots of our ecological crisis. It was published in the journal Science in 1967, and it is the most quoted journal article on theology and the environment ever quoted anywhere. It's always brought up, it's always cited. If, if any of you guys are studying ecology or biology or anything in that field, I bet your professors know that name, because he's very important. And basically what his article said is that any, any ecological crisis that we have faced or will face is the blame of the Judeo-Christian worldview. It's Christianity's fault. And specifically, it's the fault of the Bible, Genesis. And he didn't say this as a joke or tongue-in-cheek. He felt very strongly that in a nutshell, Christianity introduced for the first time in human history this worldview in which human beings are now pit against nature. And all of a sudden human beings are not only sanctioned but encouraged to exploit nature, to use nature solely for whatever human beings can get from it or pull from it for our own good and see no good in, in and of itself to creation, right? And he points largely to Genesis to show this. Um, what's interesting about White is he didn't think giving up on Christianity or secularism or technology were the answer to this. He thought we needed to rethink Christianity in general. And um, again, I don't think White was correct in this, but his solution was essentially to strip down the barriers between human beings and nature. And to say essentially that human beings are no different, we are no better than, we are not really separate in any way from the rest of nature. We're all the same. And to some degree, that's true. I mean, we're all a part of this, but it's problematic if we're actually no different than the created world around us. And where that led him was all sorts of different understandings of what we could do. And it, for him, it sanctioned things like abortion. It sanctioned euthanasia. It sanctioned population control in the same way that we need to deal with over, overpopulation of deer or something, or an overpopulation of wolves in Yellowstone National Park, which happened a few years ago. It's the same way we should deal with what we see as overpopulation of human beings. And it's no different. We should deal with it in the same way. That's a really problematic way to view the world, I think. Now, here's the question. Is, White, is Lynn White Jr. right or wrong? I think there are ecological problems. There's environmental problems to worry about. So is it Christianity's fault? I think it's a question we need to face. Is it the Bible's fault? Um, and I think it's safe to say that a lot, maybe even a majority, of most mainstream environmentalists think the answer is yes. It is Christianity's fault. And quite frankly, I don't think Christians have done the best job of proving them wrong. I think we make ourselves look very stupid a lot of times. Um, some of White's premises are correct, but his conclusions are all wrong. Now, I just want to quote something. I have my Bible. Um, like I said, he blamed the Genesis narrative. And I just want to quote this really fast, if I can get that to stay. What he quoted was Genesis chapter 1. And right after human beings are created, here's what God says to them. This is in... You can tell it's a well-used Bible because it's literally falling apart. But, but what it says in verse 28 is God. <laughs> it really is a well-worn Bible, especially this page. 
And God blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Fill the earth and subdue it. You guys heard that before? Really, for Linway Jr., there was four words. The idea of having dominion over the earth, the idea of subduing the earth, and the idea of being in the image of God. Those three things were really problematic. Image, dominion, subdue. Why? Well, what White realized is that all throughout the rest of the Bible, image, dominion, subduing, those are all royal terms. I don't know how much you guys have studied the Bible, but the story of the Old Testament is really a story about a lot of kings who are really, really terrible people and who use their power to exploit other people and who use their authority to subdue people and push people down and abuse the poor and do all sorts of terrible things. And in a certain sense, White was right. He read through the Old Testament. He realizes, yeah, this is, these terms that are supposed to apply to the kings, these kings are awful, and they do things precisely that they're not supposed to do. But here's the problem. The Bible has really two ways of looking at the world. There is the ideal, and then there's the real. There's the ideal, and there's the real. Here's one of the, one of the problems is what the Bible is. And the Bible is fundamental to our understanding and being able to have a conversation about the environment. People tend to think, well, you know, up in Boulder, I get this question a lot. I have a lot of students who come, and actually, sometimes I've been yelled at for the Bible before and, and had people say, well, how can you believe in this book when all of these people are doing these terrible things and these great kings are polygamists and they're adulterous and they rape and they pillage and they do all of these terrible things? How can you believe in a Bible that says that's okay? And the answer is the Bible does not say that's okay. The Bible simply telling a story about people sinning is not the same as the Bible justifying those sins. The story the Bible is telling is there's the way that people are supposed to be, and then there's the way that we usually end up being. The, the word for the first five books of the Bible that the Hebrew people use is the word Torah. Anyone heard that word before? Torah. It actually comes from another Hebrew word, which is a verb called yara, which actually means to throw something or to point something. So I drove up from Boulder on I-25. There's a bunch of road signs that talk about how far away Fort Collins is. And to the Hebrew, those are actually called yara. And there's this exit where I got off on Prospect Road and the, sign, the arrow literally pointed that way, get off. That's what the word Torah literally means. It's supposed to be something that points you in a certain direction, that directs you, that says it's that way, go this way. And one of the ways that the Bible does that is often by showing us what not to do by giving us examples of people who are not living out what they're supposed to be, who are not being examples of the people they're called to, and so that we can look at them and say, wow, I don't want to be like that. And that's actually how the Hebrew, Bible, how the Hebrew people read the Bible. Now again, image, likeness, subdue, dominion, all of these are royal terms. They're all references to the king. And in the Bible, the king in the Old Testament was supposed to be the image of God for the rest of the world. The king of the Old Testament was supposed to be like a, a small s sacrament. A sacrament is, is a visible sign of an invisible reality. The idea was God is the king of kings. And he's given us this person to look to that should remind us of what that looks like. Now the problem is they always failed at it. And we're not that much different. Christians today are supposed to be the light of the world. The world is supposed to look at Christianity. They're supposed to look at John the 23rd or St. Thomas Aquinas up in Boulder and say, wow, that's how God wants us to live. And that's a pretty startling thing to realize that that's how people ought to look at us because I'm not always living that out. And I'm usually failing at it, right? But there's the ideal, what God is supposed to be. Now, to really understand and unpack this idea, we have to take a step even further back than that. Because what the Bible is asking human beings to be is some, someone's people who are in the image and likeness of him, who are representatives of him. So take a step back. The very beginning of the Bible. Who knows what the very first thing the Bible says is? What's the first thing that happens in the Bible? In the beginning. What happens in the beginning, though? What's in the beginning? Darkness, some people said. Some people said God. Some, somebody said water. What's in the beginning? It's definitely not nothing. The first four words of the Bible are, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Now that sentence continues and said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was a formless wasteland and what some of you said. But it's fundamental that we get that. In the beginning, God. 
Before there was anything else, there is God. Well, who's God? Well, the God that we know and the God that Christians believe in and profess is a God that we believe is so perfect, so real, that the very word that God speaks is so real and so tangible that it actually is another person. And we call that person the Son. We call him Jesus, the Word of God made flesh, right? You guys heard that before? God is so real, his word is another person, and the love relationship between those two persons is so real and so tangible that it too is another person. We call that the Holy Spirit, right? That is the God that the Christian tradition believes in. A God who from the beginning is fundamentally relationship, community, family. That's the God we believe in. That being said, what happens? What does that God who is community fundamentally do? Well, then he begins to create. And we kind of know this story, right? So God creates the heavens and the earth. He creates the plants and the dinosaurs and everything else. And then humanity. And you can kind of take a step back. And some of you may have heard me talk, but I know some of you and some of you have heard me say this. But you can take a step back and you can look at this whole picture in terms of four relationships. Remember, God is fundamentally relationship. And I've heard it said that we were created from a relationship for the sake of relationship. We're from relationship for relationship. That's who we are. That's who God is. That's what it means to image him. So in the beginning, there were four relationships. The catechism, I'm not, I'm ripping this off of the catechism of the Catholic Church. And it says this explicitly in paragraph 40, 400. But it says, in the beginning, there was a relationship, number one, between human beings and God. So there's four things that define everything around us. So first of all, human beings were in a good relationship with God. It made sense. Remember, there's those lines in Genesis, Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. They chatted. I mean, wouldn't that be nice to wake up in the morning and be like, hey, God, what's up? Hey, Scott. How's it going? <laughs> That'd be wonderful. But we don't have that. But in the beginning, I don't know, they had some semblance of that. It made sense. So there's a relationship between human beings and God. It's good. It makes sense. We do what we're supposed to. Number two, there's an internal relationship. Human beings are what we're supposed to be. There's, I don't know how many mornings I've gotten up and looked in the mirror and, you know, when you're just like, oh man, you were just a wreck today, you know? <laughs> Last night, my, my, one of my kids kept me up all night and I was tired and I looked in the mirror at like 5.30 and I'm like, oh, you suck, Scott. <laughs> just, but there was actually a time when that wasn't so. When we were actually properly ordered, we could have looked in the mirror and actually loved what we saw because we recognized, wow, God created me. I'm beautiful. This is good. And we didn't do the things that we weren't supposed to do. We actually, our, our passions were lined up with who God made us to be. If there was two options for a drink, one was water and one was a Diet Coke or something, I'd choose the water because that's better for me. Or a donut and a carrot, right? We know what's good for us, but now we're in this weird situation where we don't do what's good for us. Those are pathetic examples, but you know what I mean. So two relationships so far. Number one, we're in a relationship with God. Number two, we're in a relationship with ourselves. We made sense to ourselves. Number three, human beings were in a relationship with one another. Remember in the beginning, it was just a couple. It was just Adam and Eve, but their relationship made sense. They were created instantly in the bond of marriage where they could give themselves to one another. They were companions. It was good. That is a beautiful thought. There was no war. There was no strife. There was no fighting. It made sense. And then fourth, lastly, and this gets forgotten about, there was a good relationship between human beings and the rest of creation, the rest of the created order. Adam, at one point in Genesis, is told to go name all of the animals. Every ancient culture in civilization recognizes naming something as implying a relationship with it. It was good. Creation made sense. Now, something went wrong. I had a literature professor who always taught that every good story has got to have a good problem. And so the good problem that comes up in Genesis of this good fourfold relationship is that it all begins to unfold. Now, those four things are not co-equal. They're kind of a democracy because there's one that's greater than the others. Because human beings had this relationship with God, all of the others made sense. It was the one that caused the others to flow. It was the life source of the other three relationships. So what happened? Well, that thing called original sin happened, which, you know, the story of original sin is the apple, right? It's not about the apple. It's not about the fruit. It's about the fact that human beings let their trust in their creator die. God said, I love you. I want to care for you. I want you to have these happy lives. Just trust me on this one thing. Don't do this. And what could human beings not do? They could not trust. So that first relationship is now damaged. Does that make sense? We're no longer trusted God. He's holding out. He's keeping something from me that must be really great because he told me I couldn't have it. I want it. So they grab at it. They grasp it. And because of that, 
if you read Genesis, all the rest of them begin to fall apart. As soon as they tr stop trusting God, as soon as they do the thing that he asked them not to do, who knows, what's the next thing that happens to them? Do you remember? They realize they're naked. They realize they're naked. What does that suggest? It suggests this thing that we call shame. That means there's something internally that's now broken. There's something about me that I am ashamed of and I don't want seen. Internally, I don't like what I'm putting out in the world anymore. And simultaneously, there's shame because I don't want the other person seeing it. Because, you know, John Paul II, St. John Paul II wrote about this, called it the moment of original shame. And he said there was probably this moment where Adam and Eve, whoever it was, realized, wow, I can actually look at that person now in a way that I probably shouldn't look at them. That is for my own benefit, something I can get from them. And if I can do that to the other person, they can probably do it to me as well. I better cover up. So simultaneously, we're ashamed of something, and we don't trust the other person. They all break down. And then lastly, you know, when God finds them, and he comes looking for them, he says, where have you gone? He says, well, here we are. We hid. First they hid from God, then they hid from each other. When God gives the punishments for this original sin, for not trusting him, does anyone remember what the punishment that Adam receives is? Toil. Toil, yeah, that's, that's a part of it. Is it just work? Is work the punishment? Anyone know? It's very specific in Genesis, do you know? The earth will be against him. The earth is going to oppose him, literally, that's it. It's not just work, you remember, what was Adam's, what was Adam's job in the beginning of the Bible? He was supposed to protect, guard, but he had to put it, in, put it in normal terms that we think about. What was he supposed to do in the world? To till it and keep it. What do, what do we call people who till and keep soil? Farmer or gardener. That's what he is. He's a gardener or a farmer. That's his job, to till and keep and protect the world around him. Now all of a sudden that job, that's good. That's why the Catholic Church has always fundamentally said work is very good. It's good that we have bodies that can do things and have manual labor. Those are really good. But now, with this sin, the earth is going to oppose him. The work is going to become, like you said, toilsome. And he's going to sweat and bleed and get blisters and thistles in his hands. And there's going to be weeds and all sorts of stuff that are just going to be very difficult. The earth will oppose you, so says Genesis. Now imagine this. Picture a world in which we don't always trust God where we do the things that we're not supposed to do, we're ashamed of ourselves, where we fight and distrust the people around us, and where the created world around us is actually pretty scary. I, I can't, I love, we run Camp Voitiwa, like Josh mentioned, with this outdoor program. We take young people into the wilderness. I can't go into the wilderness in the middle of the night by myself because I'm scared of the bear that's gonna eat me. Or just, I mean, I don't know if you guys go camping alone. I, I tried it once and it was just terrifying. I'm like, I hate camping alone, this sucks. I want somebody to talk to, and I'm afraid a bear's going to eat me. That suggests to you that there's something wrong with the world around us. You know, C.S. Lewis actually said that one of the greatest signs that there must be a heaven is how not at home we all feel here. We're just not comfortable here. There's something wrong around us. We're always kind of looking for something else. We're freaked out by everything. We're a disaster, right? <laughs> Something's wrong. But think about this. A world that we don't trust God, we do stupid things that we're not supposed to do, we fight with the people around us, and the created world is just kind of freaky. Does that sound like the world we live in? I'll say it again. We don't trust God, we do stupid things, we fight with the people around us, and the created world can be really scary. Is that the world we live in? No. It sounds like it, doesn't it? Does it sound like the world we live in? Yes. Is it the world we live in? No, and this is the crux of all of Christianity. So if you forget everything else tonight, remember this. We live, and I'm ripping this line off from a good priest friend of mine who had a very brilliant line. His name is Monsignor Swetland, and I'm stealing it from him. But he said, we do not live in a broken world. We do not live in a broken world. We live in a broken but redeemed world. We live in a broken but redeemed world. And this is the story of the New Testament. And what the New Testament says, Romans 8, or Romans 5 rather, begins Paul's whole explanation of what Jesus, this person from Nazareth, has done, is that Jesus, through Jesus, we now have reconciliation between humanity and God. He's bridged that first relationship that Adam and Eve broke. And because of Jesus, that bridge is now 
that gap is now bridged. And if that's true, and if we actually have reconciliation with God as human beings through Christ, then what does that mean for those other three relationships? It actually means that they should begin to work themselves out, doesn't it? That the Christian belief and the Christian teaching fundamentally is that you actually can be the person you're supposed to be. You actually don't have to look in the mirror and hate yourself and recognize, no, I'm actually created good. And I might not feel like it all the time, but that's reality. And we don't actually have to be a world that's full of war and strife. We can actually have a shot at reconciliation as, you know, as, as touchy-feely and, and nice and naive as that sounds. That's the Christian reality. And if that's all true, then we can actually see the natural world around us in the way that it was originally meant to be seen, which was in part a classroom to teach us who we are and who God is. That's the Christian faith. Now, here's the, here's the twist. There's a line. One of my favorite lines, I'm writing my doctoral dissertation on it. It's in Romans chapter 8, and I think it's the climax of Paul's whole thought. And I don't know if you've heard this before, but Romans 8, 19 through 22, Paul says creation itself. Paul, by the way, in the book of Romans, he's been giving this long explanation of, of faith and justification and how to be saved, and this is what Jesus has done. And then randomly, out of nowhere, he says, oh, by the way, creation, the world around you, is groaning out in travail like a pregnant woman, literally, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. And then he moves on to talking about something else. And I've done a lot of study on this. And if you go to any like, academic library or seminary, you find almost nothing written about that line. Because everyone's like, we don't know what the crap Paul's talking about there, because it makes no sense. Creation is groaning out. OK, Jesus has done this. We're baptized. We die to ourselves. We're new people. He's a new Adam. Old Adam sinned. Jesus is reconciled. Oh, by the way, creation is groaning out like a pregnant woman. Oh, yeah. And then Jesus gives us hope so we can live. You're like, what? It's just thrown in there. Now, if you recognize those four relationships, it actually makes perfect sense. Because Paul begins his whole thesis in chapter 5 by saying, look, Christ has reconciled us back to God. In chapter 7, he gives this famous discourse by saying, why do I do the things that I don't want to do? Meaning, I don't have to do the things I don't want to do. I can actually be who God called me to be. The whole letter, he's trying to solve this fight between ethnic Christian groups living in Rome that can't get along with each other. Then he climaxes the whole thing by saying, guess what? Even the created world itself has a role in this. And it's waiting for something. It's waiting. It's groaning out in travail, waiting for the revelation of... What, did anyone catch it? What's creation groaning out in travail waiting for? The sons of God, who are those? It's actually us. It's you and me. The first time I read that, I expected it to say, oh, it's groaning out in travail waiting for Christ to redeem it, or waiting for God, or waiting for salvation. But no, it's actually waiting for us, which should trouble you a little bit. There's a, a theologian, his name is Father Brendan Byrne, and he developed this thing, it's called the common fate principle. But the idea is, look, if you read the Genesis story, it's because of human beings that creation took a tumble, that it became broken and scary and kind of disordered. It's because of human beings. So if Christ has now saved human beings, then we should bring the created order with us. It's actually a divine imperative that says, look, if you actually realize what Jesus has done for you, if you realize that you've actually died to your old self, been raised up again in him, then you have a responsibility to the entire world around you. Not only yourself, not only the people that you see every day, but even creation itself, because that is what the good king from the Old Testament was supposed to do. That's what the gardener does. That's what the good farmer looks for. How can I care for my land? Because in reality, it's actually not even our land belongs to someone else, and we're stewards of it. Now, I want to mention something about those four relationships that I find fascinating. And maybe you don't have this experience, but I certainly do. There's a lot of uh, talk nowadays about the idea of liberal Catholics and conservative Catholics, or liberal Christians, conservative Christians. Have you heard these terms? I don't like these terms because they're political terms, and the church is not a political reality. But think about this for a moment. Think about those four relationships I mentioned. Now imagine this. There's a lot of people out there that are called conservative or maybe traditional, or maybe they're called by their enemies, conservative or traditional Christians. 
who believe that it's very important to foster a personal relationship with Jesus, that your prayer life matters. You should be going to the sacraments, receiving Jesus in the Eucharist, things like the sacrament of confession, prayer life, right? Really focusing on the relationship with God and the relationship with myself, becoming holy. And they're right to do that. That's actually good. We should become holy. We should grow closer to God. But sometimes it's done at the expense of the other two relationships. Now, there's also people that are often called either liberal or progressive Christians, or maybe they're called by their enemies, liberal or progressive Christians or Catholics, who really emphasize, no, we should care for the poor and think about social justice and recognize the people around us, immigrants and, and poor and, and unwed mothers and things like this. And we should care for the environment, the natural world. It's an imperative that we have. And they're right to do those things, but not at the expense of the other two relationships. I actually think you can divide these four relationships almost exactly down political lines of what people think is most important. And I think that is utterly diabolical. Because we actually, those of us who are Christians, believe in a God who died so that all four of those parts of what make up the human life could be reconciled and could actually be lived out. To split them in two, and not only that, but to pit them against one another is an incredibly dangerous thing to do. And this is why I'm firmly of the belief that good, faithful Catholics should be on the front lines of the environmental conversation, saying why this actually matters. Now, this all brings us back to the original question, right? Okay, that's all great, and that's all nice that Jesus has done this, but the reality is Catholics believe he's coming back and that the world's going to end. So that puts us back in the same spot, doesn't it? Why are we, you know, maybe you've heard the analogy, just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Okay, the ship is sinking, so let's rearrange the chairs and make them all look pretty. That's dumb. But it's not dumb. Here's why. Paul understands something that we don't. The Bible understands something. The earliest Christians understand something that we don't. And there was a concept that they believed in. It was something called inaugurated eschatology, which is a really big, fancy theological word. But really what it means is that, as Christians, we're called to believe that the end times began 2,000 years ago. It's already here. We're not waiting, you know, do a Google search on Book of Revelation, and it's amazing the stuff that you'll find. Don't do it. It's crazy, though. <laughs> but I mean, you know, we think about the end times or the end of the world, and there's fire, and politicians' heads explode. I mean, these are all things you can find on Google. Um, they're all missing the point entirely. We've been in the last days. We've been in the end times since Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. Now, here's a concept our Jewish ancestors got that we don't necessarily get. There's this concept that, that sometimes I call it the two ages. Here's the deal. People in the time of Jesus and in the time of Paul thought about the world in a very specific way, and they thought about the world in terms of two ages or two periods of time. Now, stay with me on this because this is a little weird. Imagine, and if I had a, a whiteboard, I'd draw it, but I, I don't, so. Um, imagine the Garden of Eden, right? You're in the garden. Things are good. The Christian understanding is that, you know, there, there was no death or pain in the same way that we experience now. Things were just really good. Those four relationships were intact. And then we have this thing called original sin. Does anyone know what the other term for original sin is? There's one other really well-known term for original sin. What do we call that event? The fall, right? So imagine the Garden of Eden. Humanity, the whole world, we're on this kind of really high plane of being. Everything's good. But then there's the fall, and we drop, right? And that ushers what the ancient Jewish people called the old age, or sometimes it's called the present age. And what that looked like, there was an age of time brought in by Adam and Eve where the world was defined by war and strife and sin and chaos and ugliness and fighting and unforgiveness and all sorts of stuff. That sounds like our world, doesn't it? Those four relationships in crisis. But everyone believed that someday God would step back into human history and he would set things right. That he would raise his people back up to a really high state of existence. That's what they called the age to come. Or sometimes it was called the new age, but that has different meanings for us. So, but it was called the age to come. And again, God would step into this age of sin and death and corruption and chaos, and he would set things right. And the bad guys would go one way, the good guys would go the other way. All evil, all sin, all tears would be wiped away, and everything would be perfect again. Does that make sense? Two ages. One's bad, one's good. So here's the question. Which one do we live in? 
Do we live in the age that's marked by sin and death and chaos and war and fighting? Or do we live in the age that's defined by reconciliation and peace and grace and things being set back to where they're supposed to be? Where do we live? We actually live in this weird spot right in the middle. We live in the overlap. Now what really no Jewish author thought is that there would be an in-between time. They just kind of saw, and you could find this in like the Dead Sea Scrolls, all sorts of writings that just it would kind of happen like that. God would step in, everything would be good again. And the bad guys would go that way, and the good guys would go this way, and everything's set. Nobody quite expected what happened, and what happened was this. And here's what the Bible and what the early Christians actually say. When original sin happened, way back in the beginning, it's as if humanity, not just humanity, but the whole world, even the natural world, creation, became impregnated with this hope. And it grew. And throughout the course of human history, humanity hoped more and more and more that someday God would come and save us and set us free from this really weird existence that we have on earth and that everything would be turned back to the way it was supposed to be. And then Jesus came and God actually stepped into time and he became a human being. Now, what the ancient church fathers, what the saints said was that the moment Jesus stepped out of the tomb, if we're thinking about that childbirth analogy, and Jesus even uses it, he talks about birth pangs at the end. But they said, if you think about this, if you think about the hope that we have had that God would save us as this long pregnancy, and what's pregnancy? It's always waiting for new life, rebirth. They said when Jesus stepped out of the tomb on Easter Sunday, it was as if the water broke. I'm not trying to get weird with the imagery, but... <laughs> I don't know if any of you have been pregnant before. There is a baby here, so probably somebody has. But <laughs> does anyone know what happens in a pregnancy right after the water breaks? Labor. Labor, right? <laughs> usually, usually it's the guys who are like, then the baby comes. And anyone who's had a baby is like, no, it's not when the baby comes. <laughs> what, ha what happens when the water breaks is that that's when the real labor begins. That's when the pain, that's when the tribulation, that's when the birth pangs start and it gets real. That's what happens when the water breaks. But we know that the end of that story is that there's going to be a new life at the end of it. And the church all said in the early days that when Jesus stepped out of the tomb on Easter Sunday, the water broke. This new life is actually breaking into the world, but we're not going to see it in its fullness until the day that he comes again. And he will come again someday. But what that means is that, I don't know if you've heard, you know, the fundamentalist Bible preachers and stuff, and I, I, was in this, I lived in the South for one summer, and I would turn on the radio, and I would just listen to these guys yell. And they got really worked up, and they would always be yelling about the signs of the times, and all the terrible things happening, and the war, and the natural disasters, and how obviously this world is going down. Because look at all the pain, and strife, and birth pangs that we're experiencing. Surely it's the end. But the Catholic view has always been different. It's not that, I mean, have you ever felt that way? Have you ever you know, read the news or turned on the, the TV or looked at the internet and been like, wow, it just feels like it's getting worse and worse every day. More war, more killing, more uh, um, terrorism, more natural disasters that are worse than the last one. Do you ever feel like that? It's getting worse every day, isn't it? Guess what, you're probably right. It is getting worse every day. But what the Catholic view says is that if that's the case, it doesn't mean that the end is coming, it means that the beginning is coming. Because just as we believe that Jesus actually had to suffer and die and then rise again, renewed, transformed, and glorious, so we actually also believe that the entire world around us, even though it will pass in a certain sense, it's passing because we believe in what's called the new heavens and the new earth. There will be a new creation. But here's the thing. Jesus... When he went to the cross, when he rose again on Easter Sunday, the reading, if you were at Mass last Sunday, it was, I, I love that reading. It's where everybody was kind of, there were, all the apostles were in the upper room and they're all kind of flipping out. And Jesus shows up and he's like, hey, I'm real. And they're like, no, you're a ghost. And he's like, give me your fish. Do you have anything to eat? I'm going to eat some fish and show you that I have a body. And then Thomas wants to stick his fingers in the wound. And Seriously, it's a creepy reading. But <laughs> the whole point of what Jesus is trying to show is that, look, I'm real. I actually have a physical body. There was a bunch of heresies in the early days of the church that said, well, this guy, Jesus, if he's really God, then he didn't really suffer because God can't suffer because he's God, right? And the church said, no, he really did. 
It's a real body. It didn't just look like a body. It didn't just appear to be a body. God took on a body, like you and I have, with all of its, its failings and its frailties, except for sin. But that means when the God of the universe, who holds all things in existence, when he got tired, he had to sleep. When he got hungry, he actually had to eat. He became a baby. Who I have two children. I've changed a lot of diapers. In my, I, the thought that God actually became the kind of being that needed his diaper changed is a real, if you want to reflect on something, <laughs> that's, he did. That's the most humbling thing I can imagine. God shows that to show that, look, the material world matters. I'm going to take on matter flesh, humanity, to show that it's important, and then I will rise on the third day in flesh, in material. And that's why, you know, this is one of the things that actually brought me back to the Catholic Church after I had left, is that I realized the Catholic Church, as far as I could tell, was really the only church that cared about material, that cared about matter. And I was used to going to churches where we'd sing some songs and we'd hear a good sermon or a message, and then we'd go home. And it actually had nothing to do with my physical body or me. But then I went to the Catholic Church, and there's water, and there's oil, and there's smells, and I'm standing and sitting and kneeling, and I'm eating things, and I'm drinking things. It's very material, because we actually believe in a God who loves his creation. He loves matter. For those of us who are Catholics, you know, we call Jesus, we talk about the Eucharist, which we believe that God actually becomes bread. And that bread becomes God. He becomes, it becomes Jesus. Um, you know, think about that for a minute, if you are a Catholic. And even if you're not, think about it. Bread. <laughs> the idea of bread. Every culture in the history of human civilization, what has bread always symbolized? Not just food. Bread has always had a much deeper symbol for every culture in human history. What is bread? Not just bounty, it's more specific. Bread is life. Bread is life. It is a common denominator in all cultures. Meat is substance, vegetables, things. These are things we eat, but bread. Bread has always been the symbol and the sign which represents life. Bread is life. So what does God do? God becomes the very thing that represents him. Life becomes the thing that we've always thought of as the symbol of life. God becomes the symbol that he is. Because it matters. Because the material world is important. And because it matters how we treat it, which is why we actually need, this is also why we can't think about the environment in a void. It actually needs to be considered in terms of those other three relationships. You know, some of you may have heard Pope Francis is, uh, it's rumored that he's gonna be coming out with his first, uh, with an encyclical on the environment. And I'm curious if that'll happen. I hope it does. You know, I don't know if you guys were paying attention when Pope Francis actually became Pope. His very first homily, his very first message was that um, we need to be stewards and protectors of the created world. He made it one of his primary points of his agenda. He said we need to be protectors of the environment. And if you've been paying attention to the whole Pope Francis craze in the media, one of the things the media has loved to do lately is say, Pope Francis will say something that is consistent with what every other Pope has said, and we'll always say, oh my gosh, this brand new teaching the church has, because Francis said it, it's amazing. Francis cares about the environment. No one's ever done that before. <laughs> I want to quote a couple of things. <coughs> Two quotes. I want you to tell me who said it. See if you can guess. First one. Oh, where did they go? Okay. The first quote. It is manifestly unjust that a privileged few should continue to accumulate excess goods, squandering the Earth's resources, while masses of people are living in conditions of misery at the lowest level of subsistence. Today, the dramatic threat of ecological breakdown is teaching us the extent to which greed and selfishness, both individual and collective, are contrary to the order of creation, an order which is characterized by mutual interdependence with creation. Who said it? St. John Paul II. One more. Disregard for the environment always harms human existence, and vice versa. The destruction of the environment, its improper and selfish and violent use, its hoarding of the Earth's resources, cause grievances, conflict, wars, 
precisely because they are consequences of an inhumane concept of development. Jesus. Who said it? <laughs> Jesus. No, it wasn't Jesus. <laughs> Guess? Benedict. Pope Benedict XVI. The one who the media often portrays as the super conservative, never touches stuff like that Pope. He says, look, the dangers of the environment are what cause wars. Our mistreating of the environment, our improper, our selfish hoarding of the world's natural resources causes war. And he's absolutely right. Why? Because we don't live in a void. Those four relationships, you know, the catechism talks about those four relationships as harmonies. I don't know if any of you have singing experience, but what happens when one part of a four-part harmony is off? The whole thing doesn't sound good, right? Angie knows. The whole thing sounds bad. So what happens if one or more parts of those relationships with which Christ has reconciled is off in our lives? It's bad. It doesn't work. Now, it might... You might be able to pass, you might be able to get through, but it's never going to flourish. And what Christ actually offers us is a life where he wants us to flourish. Here's the point. What Paul tells the very first Christians, the very first people who are actually dealing with and grappling with and trying to understand what the heck Jesus has done, the very thing that he tells them is, look, if you understand what Christ has done for you, then you have to recognize that he's actually changed who you are. He has changed the relationships of the people around you. He's changed the way that you need to interact with people. And he's changed the way that you need to look at all of creation. Because guess what? Creation itself, the mountains, Poudre River, all of it is groaning out in travail like a woman giving birth, waiting for you to bring the new life to it that it's expecting. Now, how do you do that? What does that even mean? Well, what it means is that we're actually called to do the very thing that Adam was called to do in the beginning but failed at. We're called to be gardeners. We're called to be farmers. And I'm not a farmer, I'm a theologian, which is a far cry from farming, but we're called to actually treat the world in a way befitting of the kings of the Old Testament, in a way that actually images the God who created us, the God who, as Catholics, we believe, loves the material world uses bread, uses water, uses wine, uses oils, uses the human body to stand, sit, kneel, sing, actually use the material things that he's given us because they are fundamentally good. And we also believe that he's going to come back one day. And we believe that when he does come back, that we're going to actually have to account for what we have done. We're going to have to say, have we been faithful stewards? If you read the Bible as a whole, and if you look at everything it says about the end, if you look at Revelation, and there's a lines from Isaiah, the Gospels, everything about the end of the world, the second coming, I guarantee you, if you go and do a search on this, you will almost never find references to us as humans going off somewhere. You will always find references to heaven coming here. You ever thought about that? We've got a twisted view on the end of the world. Because what our culture has taught us, even the Christian culture, what it's taught us is that there's going to come a time when we get to get the heck out of this place. This place that's hard, and we suffer, and we sin, and we fight, and we have war and strife, and the creation's scary. Someday Christ is going to come, and I can get the heck out of here. That's not Christianity. Christianity says, yes, there's war. Yes, there's strife. Yes, I'm in pain. Yes, I carry baggage. Yes, the created world is scary. But guess what? Christ is going to come back someday, and everything will look like it's supposed to look. The veil will be lifted. All the pain that I carry with me, the, the ravages of the flood that we got two years ago, we're all going to see those things for what they're supposed to be. The veil will be lifted. The material world will be restored. And just like Jesus, it will actually look glorified transformed, transfigured. And when he comes back, I hope that we as gardeners, as farmers, as stewards, don't just say, well, we just figured you were coming back and you could deal with it later, or that you were just going to throw it out, so we didn't do anything with it. I mean, it sounds trite, but we actually have to consider that. Is it any coincidence that when Jesus rises from the dead, if you've been paying attention to the Easter readings at Mass, is it any coincidence that Jesus, think about this, was buried in a garden. Do you know that's where his burial spot was? It was in the midst of a garden, which means when he rises from the dead on Sunday, 
He is something coming out of the ground in a garden, like a new plant. And when the women come to the tomb to find him, they recognize him as a gardener. Here's a gardener, buried in a garden, rising like a garden, recognized by the women as a gardener. Do you think Christ is trying to tell us something about the way that we're meant to interact with the world? I didn't come here tonight with the idea that I was going to give you all these practical tools and ways to go out and care for the environment. That's not my intention. My intention in this talk was to demonstrate that we as Christians have reason to consider the importance of the material world. What you do with that is up to you. What conversations that sparks is up to you. But what we do need to realize is that in Christ's vision for humanity, matter matters. We'll close there. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. All right. Just a reminder, um, we're going to go into just a few uh, question and answers right now. So if you do have a question, um, if you want to text it in to 22333, uh, it's 250-413, plus your question. I'll get it right here. Um, real quick, um, a, few, a few people um, were asking. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Um, a few people were asking, um, you mentioned a lot about caring for matter. Um, yeah. can, can that be taken too far Is it, or, or too much of an extreme? You know, yeah. That, yeah, that's a fantastic question. So can it be taken too far? Yes, of course it can be taken too far. Here's an example, though. Again, I, I think of my own upbringing and my own circumstances in Boulder where I grew up. I know a lot of people, and again, I don't, I don't know what the culture of Fort Collins as well, but I know a lot of people back in Boulder that um, turn to earth worship and to worshiping creation. Uh, and I don't know if you've experienced that or seen that. I actually know a lot of people that want to worship the earth and Mother Earth and these things. Think about this for a second. If you're, um, I don't know, I, I was driving here tonight. There's this beautiful sunset I was looking at off to my left, and you could see Long's Peak, and it was just, you know, you know those nights when it's just like incredible. And I was looking, if you didn't know that there was a God, and you saw this profoundly beautiful image, this profound beauty, wouldn't you, well, let me put it this way. Let's change the example. Say you didn't know what a mirror was. You had no idea what a mirror was. You've never seen a mirror before in your life, and you saw the reflection of someone in a mirror. If you didn't know what a mirror was, wouldn't you think that the reflection you were seeing was the reality? Really, if you've never heard of a mirror, you don't know the idea of reflection. You think what you're seeing is reality. In the same way, if you have no idea that there is a God, you see something that profoundly reflects his glory and beauty, isn't the only proper response to worship it? I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying we should be earth worshipers. But I'm saying it's actually a logical conclusion. And I think that's a great starting point for a conversation. Because then, see, here's the reason I brought up that quote from Dostoevsky at the beginning. Dostoevsky said, beauty will save the world. I believe that we're living in a culture, I'm very serious about my faith, and our faith teaches about these things called the transcendentals. Anyone heard of the transcendentals? You know what they are? There's three of them. Truth, truth is one. Goodness. goodness and beauty. Truth, goodness, and beauty. The church says those are the things we need to focus on. Focus on these things. Now, I think we live in a culture that is not in agreement about what truth is. We're like Pilate, Pontius Pilate. What is truth? And you can get into an argument with somebody across the street on campus about what you could possibly defining as truth. Well, my truth is different than that. This is what your truth looks like. Truth, you can get nowhere. Goodness, what does it mean to be good? Well, that even sounds like a generic term. What is goodness? Well, I, I'm good because I'm allowing these people to do this, or I'm good because of whatever. We can have all sorts of conversations about goodness. But beauty, beauty is hard to argue with. It's hard to argue when you see a profoundly beautiful sunset over Long's Peak. That simply touches something in the human heart. It just does. That's how we're made. We're made to recognize that. So I'm convinced utterly and completely that if we actually want to get to the culture with the good news of Jesus Christ, the way to do it is not necessarily through truth, although we have to use truth. It's not through goodness necessarily, although we use that, but we can do it through beauty because beauty is irrefutable, I think. We can have different opinions on things that are beautiful, but when human person recognizes beauty, it's hard to argue. So can you take this too far? Of course you can take it way too far. But what do we do in response? Those of us who are Christians, those of us who are Catholics, when we encounter the people who are taking it too far, do we do what so many of the good Catholics that I know do, which is just mock them or talk about how stupid they are? 
Or do we recognize, well, I actually see where you're coming from, but here's why I think that's the wrong way to go about it. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm very tempted when I see people doing things that are totally wrong or worshiping dirt out in a, in a, you know, a heat yurt or a, a sweat lodge or something and think, wow, that's just dumb. That's not the right way to approach it because it's actually not dumb. It's actually quite logical. If you take the time to step back and say, wow, why would a person come to that conclusion? Oh, it's because beauty is actually so powerful that you can misunderstand where the beauty is coming from. So can you take it too far? Of course you can take it too far. What should we do? We should try to figure out the starting point of where the people who we think are taking it too far are actually coming from and then use that for cause for a conversation. This is what we talk about up in Boulder. We're talking about how do we go on campus? How do we engage our professors? How do we engage our fellow students that are coming from totally different places than we are and have actual, intelligent, respectful conversations? Because that will win people's hearts. Actual, respectful, intelligent conversations and beauty to top it off, that will change people's minds. And that will convince people that maybe Christians aren't as weird or as dumb or as strange as we thought that they were. That's my experience. Now, you may have answered this uh, a few times, um, but, but we, have, <laughs> we, we, have, we have a few people um, who are curious to know, and I think you touched on it, especially with um, uh, your evangelizing through beauty. Um, they're, they're curious to know, um, um, how, you know, how would you recommend um, we, I guess, evangelize, maybe some practical tips, um, even through, you know, conversations about the environment. Right. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to expand on that. You know, I know you just spoke a little bit about maybe using beauty as the starting point. Um, yeah. Maybe go from there. Yeah, I mean, I think in all circumstances, the key to evangelization is personal witness. And this is, the popes, the last three popes have all talked about this. People don't care about teachers, they care about witnesses. And if a witness is also a teacher, then all the better, right? So, again, a lot of my friends that I grew up with, um, they know I go to church, they know I actually work for a church, heaven forbid. And, you know, the, the line, which I often get, and maybe you guys get this too, is like, oh, you know, up at Vail, that's my cathedral. That's my church. I'm going backpacking this weekend. I'm going there on Sunday. That's my church. Have you, ever, you guys ever heard that? Maybe you've said it. I don't know. And my response to that is always like, yeah, me too. But I have another one that I go to as well. It's not an either or. And what I usually do is say, man, you know, there was this time, and, and don't lie, but I mean, I've actually had some of the most profound encounters with Jesus Christ that I've had in my life occurred in the wilderness. And I can say, wow, you know, there was this one time in high school, I was on this backpacking trip, and I saw the world in a whole different way, and I realized that, Jesus, that there was this God who loved me, and there was this creation, and I could take a part in it, and it was, it was beautiful, you know, and, and go from there, but say, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. And I had this experience. I mean, see, here's the thing. If you read through the Gospels, Every time that people try to mess with Jesus, you know, there's always the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Jesus will do something. He'll perform a miracle. They'll get ticked off, and they'll try to call him out on it. There's this one scene about this blind guy. You probably, it's in the Gospel of John. There's this blind guy. Jesus heals him. He's freaking out. Jesus disappears someplace. And all the religious leaders want to trap Jesus. And so they find the kid's parents, and they're like, hey, who did this to your son? What happened? What's going on? We want to trap this guy. And they're like, we don't know. Talk to him yourself. You know, he's an, he's an adult. So they go to the guy, and they're like, who is this? What is this guy who did this? And I love his response. He simply says, he's like, I don't really know who he was. All I know is that I used to be blind, and then I met this guy, and now I can see. And it completely shuts up the religious leaders. Because what do you say to that? He's not making a claim about Jesus' divinity or making this claim that's theological. He says, here's where I was then, then I met this guy Jesus, and here's where I am now. That's the best kind of witness you can ever give. Don't, get, don't meet somebody and give an apologetic for why you know, A must equal B, which equals C. Say, yeah, this is where I was coming from, and then this thing happened to me, and I prayed for the first time, or I went to Mass, and I was totally different afterwards. And I had this totally different experience, and I still wanted to go skiing on Sunday, but I actually wanted to go to Mass too, because that actually helped me be a better skier. I don't, I don't know. Have you guys heard of Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati? Yeah. He is one of my favorite saints. Part of the reason why is because he embodies those four relationships in a way that I've actually never seen embodied before. Saint, uh, Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati's day. He grew up in Turin, Italy in what, the early 1900s. And um, 
his typical day would consist, he would get up early, he would do his daily prayer, he would go to mass, he would connect with his creator, he would work on his own personal holiness by prayer and receiving the sacraments. Then he would go out and usually climb a giant peak or go skiing or go scale a rock face. And there's all these you know, pictures of him like smoking pipes on top of these awesome mountains. He would go and he would fall in love with the created world. Then he'd come back home and he'd work in the soup kitchen or he'd serve the poor for a few hours and then he'd go home. And that was his day. And that is embodying all four of those relationships. He's like, I'm going to take advantage of every single aspect of what Christ has redeemed for me. And I'm, going to, I'm not going to pit them against each other. I'm going to embody them. And it's that reason that when he died, you know, he was from this rich family. His parents kind of thought he was crazy. They didn't really know what he was doing. And then he died at age 25, I think. And 10,000 people showed up for his funeral. And his parents were like, who are you? Who are you all? But he made a witness. And people, you know, he didn't have to stand on the street corner and preach. They saw how he lived his life, and they're like, I want to be like him. He's got something that I don't have. I didn't listen to some great theological teaching of his, but I see that he's something that I'm not. I want that. If Christians lived that way, if you and I lived our lives how we're supposed to live our lives, we wouldn't need apologetics. We wouldn't actually need a bunch of theology to go out and give the world because we'd be embodying it and then people would ask us and say, wait, where does that come from? And we could answer it. That's evangelization. That's the key to it. I don't do it well, um, but you know, I'm, I'm profoundly moved. I've only worked in, camp, in, in university ministry up in CU for a couple of years and I was working in other, other realms before that and I'm so profoundly moved. I'm sure you guys are the same way, or at least I hope you are, about how many students I have coming into my office on a day-to-day -day basis saying, here's what my professor said, I disagree with it, how do I actually talk to him or her? But how do I not just attack them? How do I actually have a conversation? Where are they coming from? Where are they getting that? Because I really want to understand so that I can come back and show them where I'm coming from. And they're doing it. And I've got students that are, they're blowing their professors away because they're like, I've never actually heard a Catholic explain it that way and say this. And I'm so, I'm so humbled by it because it's not something I know if I would have had the courage to do in college or even now. But that's what changes people. It's actually personal witness. And that's how to evangelize. In all respects, that's how we evangelize. That's the gospel model that Jesus gives us. That's what I think Blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati gives us. And that's the best we can do. Because you guys have all seen the people who just yell and shout. And you, you always know, everybody knows when you're in a discussion with someone and you can tell their intention is just to shut you up or just to win the argument, right? We all know when we're in this, we're not stupid. The people around us aren't stupid either. They know, we all know when we're actually being heard and when we're not being heard. You know when someone's talking over you, you know when someone's not actually listening to you and just thinking about the next thing that they're gonna say. Don't do that. As hard as it might be, don't do that because you're actually never gonna win anybody over. And that's just a reality. So uh, last question, I'm um, interest of time. There were yeah. uh, more than a few more, but we were, someone was very curious, and <laughs> there was a caveat here. It says, uh -oh. in the state of Colorado, uh -oh. um, is it considered a sin to not recycle? <laughs> I don't think you could be prosecuted for it. Um, but no, let's, let's say that, so yeah, not, it's not legal. It's not a legal thing. But um, let's actually, I, I, here's an interesting point on this. The recycling question is a tricky one. Um, I, you know, I, I, yeah, I do, I do value these things. And I remember, it was actually a good Catholic friend uh, once challenged me with the whole recycling thing. And they, they said, you know, Scott, and this is a well-known statistic, you know that it takes far more energy to actually recycle a glass bottle than the output that it's actually saving. So you're actually using more energy per bottle to actually recycle it than you would be to just throw it away. And that, that's, a statistical fact. And um, I heard, I, I believe it was John Paul II, not, and I, I'm paraphrasing all of it, but he was actually approached with something like that at one point. And they were like, is it really that important? And his answer was, it's not, it's not a one-to-one -one energy output issue for us, especially for us as Christians. It's not, okay, I'm gonna recycle this because then this can can turn into something else and then somebody can have a lunchbox and then that, you know, that equals that. No, that's not really the idea because Oh, I hesitate to say this, but I mean, yeah, one can that I recycle is not going to make all that much of a difference. That's true. One bottle I recycle is going to take more energy than it's actually going to give back. That's true. But here's the catch, and here's the difference. 
When I recycle a can or I recycle a bottle, it means I actually have to think about something that's outside of myself. I might have to actually work a little bit harder to think about the things that I'm using. And what we're called to do is not simply rote recycle things because you're told to do it in your machine, so you just put your can in there and you do this. What we're called to do as Christians is think about the things that we're dealing with. Think about the world that you're interacting with. Think about the impact that this cup is actually going to have. If I leave, I don't know, I was, I was, I'm hearing about this drought in California. Have you heard about this? This awful drought in California, and I was hearing this story about Oh, I, and I'm not, I'm not, this is not meant to be a political reality, but it goes back to what John Paul II, St. John Paul II was saying, and Benedict XVI. There's some town in Cal, I, I heard a story on the radio, there's this town in California near Bakersfield, and it, you know, California's got all these water restrictions, and they're not being allowed to use certain amounts of water because they've got to save because it's really bad. And there's this little town in Bakersfield, which is very poor, and it's mainly full of immigrants, and they, um, the water restrictions are allowing them to not even have enough water to bathe. And they're like, well, that's great that you're giving these restrictions and we get it, but like, we don't use water to water our lawns. We're not washing our cars. We're using it to bathe and to drink and sometimes to wash our dishes. And you've actually cut that much too. And you have to wonder where else in the state or where else is the water being misused so that these particular poor people actually don't have enough water to use to actually wash their dishes at the end of the day. Where's the disparity there? And that's the kind of thing where, you know, when I leave the sink running, it's not just, okay, I have to be, con be conservation-minded, and, you know, the TV tells me I have to conserve water, so I have to do it. It's thinking, okay, this water is actually a gift to me from God. He's given me this, and he's given me a certain stewardship over this. Where's this water going? Who could be using this water? Um, you know, this is why Benedict said, you know, our, our improper or selfish violent hoarding of the Earth's resources. It's not about how much energy can we put out by doing this. It's about creating an atmosphere of selflessness. When I recycle a can or recycle a bottle or turn off the water when I need to turn off the water, I'm training myself to be less selfish than I am. Because my temptation and my natural predisposition is to be selfish and it's to leave the water running longer than I should have because I want it to be more comfortable, or to throw the can in this trash can because it's just closer and I don't want to walk over there. But again, it's not about the can, it's not about the water, it's about creating predispositions of selflessness in ourselves. That's why we're sp supposed to do these things. And if the greater good that actually comes out of it is actually processed in the right way, then all the better. But the first intention is always to change the way that I look at the world, the way that I look at the things that I'm interacting with. Because, again, in the plan of God, everything actually matters. Not just the big things, not just the massive wars, not just the huge droughts. All of it actually matters. St. Irenaeus has that great quote. He says, that which is not assumed is not redeemed. By which he simply means Christ either came to save everything or he came to save nothing. It's an all or nothing deal. He came to save every single person walking around out there, every single person in every frat house, in every bar, or he came to save none of us. He came to save every piece of creation, every drop of water in the Poudre River, or he came to save none of it. It's an all or nothing deal with what Christ has done. He is in all for all. And so that means everything we interact with is something for which Christ shed his blood which is a troubling way to look at the world. But it's the first step, I think, into training ourselves to not only be less selfish, but to actually be holy. Because holiness comes from denying ourselves. I think the world would be a very different place if everyone took five minutes out of their day, every day, to think about how they could actually think about themselves less. Our world is the way it is because we're a culture who thinks about nothing but ourselves all day long. And I'm as guilty of that as anybody else. We just want to think about ourselves. We don't want to think about the impact that what we're doing has on someone else. That's the reality. That's why we're supposed to recycle. That's why we're supposed to conserve water. Yes, there is benefit at the other end. Absolutely. But the far bigger benefit is I'm making myself less selfish and the person who God actually wants me to be. And that is what he wants before, well, I, yeah, I think that, Enough said on that. <laughs> Whenever I don't quite know how to end, I just keep talking, so. <laughs> Thank you, Josh.
All right, let's give it up one more time.